when I picked up the sax at 10 years old. My dad gave me Fela's entire catalogue, like a whole box of CDs, and told me to learn every horn line. <laughs> when I grew up, I started listening to all the new Fela tracks, and I knew everything. I couldn't remember why I knew everything. And I just thought, whatever I do, it has to be of worthy purpose. There was music playing. I just happened to look up on stage. And as I was looking up on stage, fellow was looking down. It was like a connection because he was different from the Africans that I previously met. I didn't know anything about Stella, where he came from. I didn't know anything about his background. I knew he was black, like me. He was African, and we were one. I first met Fella in the back of a Mercedes van on the M4 motorway, lying in a heap of African dancers on my way back from a gig. Somebody put on a cassette, and it was sorrow, tears, and blood, and I was gobsmacked. I'd never heard anything quite like it. I was a member of his Jufeti. I was the rhythm pianist in the band. Fella also was like a father to me, because I lost my father at a very early age. I met uh, Fella Kuti in 1974 and I had the opportunity to do my first cover art for his music. Fela released the album called Music of Fela, Ruffer of Fight. You know, you meet people sometimes, you know that they're a born leader, and he had this air about him. I do remember the first Fela tune I heard, which was ITT, and ITT got such a magical and deep and strong introduction. You know, the, the way this song starts, well, right away, it takes you somewhere very, very far and, uh, and deep. Just watching him was so highly educative to me because, look, he's a master of what he does and he's ever-changing, he's ever-evolving. I mean, if you look at his catalogue from the early 60s, mid-60s, early 70s, mid-70s, late 70s to the 80s, you will notice that there is a constant evolution. Seeing Fellow Live was, was quite extraordinary. First time I saw him was 77 with Africa Africa 70. And it was simply the most exciting band I'd ever seen ever. Now as a musician, as a trained musician, I wasn't overwhelmed by his talent. I was overwhelmingly inspired by it, that this man created the genre of music on his own. There is no other Afrobeat star that comes close to Fellow's creativity or stature within the music. When it was just him, me and the engineer together, he was very polite. But the minute he got up to speak with his musicians, he became the music. You know, you could sense the music in his body in the same way that he injected that enthusiasm into the, the guys that were in the band. And it was just incredible. It was amazing to listen to them, great to be there, enjoying that fantastic music. Being a master of what he does, his music, his arrangements, his discipline on stage, I was there, I watched him like a hawk, I never missed a writing session. Two, three, four. Suddenly he's sitting down in the living room and he just shouts, yo, calls his roadie, set up the rhythm section, sets up the drum kit, the congas, the bass amp, the guitar amp, and the rhythm piano. Suddenly he just comes out, okay, bass, turn on guitar. Turn on guitar is the plucking. Keep it going. Bass, two, three. To be rubber. I love you rubber. To be a rubber. When I asked him about his music and this one song that I like, and he told me it was about his soup and what he likes in his soup. And I mean, I thought it was hilarious, you know? How you gonna make the love song or whatever song about some food? Fela, he could scream. He had a big mouth. So a lot of people were afraid of him because of, of that. But the thing is that Fela was a good guy. He was very generous and he just wanted to, to do good. Fela was, uh, was quite uh, wise in the studio because he was quite experimental. Not only pioneered the style, but developed it so much in his lifestyle that the sound world changed dramatically over several decades and that he kept pushing. Most musical styles start with a group of people that are from different parts of the world, but there's a sort of Zeke Geist, and they start coming up with the same ideas at the same time. Afrobeat was one person. Feather invented Afrobeat, nobody else did. He defined it and he created the artistic paradigm, which is still used. Glory, 
We recorded three albums in, in those three days of, of recording. And one of them was the live album that we did where Ginger Baker came in and joined. He had already met and worked with Fella in Nigeria and they were very good friends. One of the great experiences of my life being in, in the the studio with those those chaps. Even without an audience there, you just had to be in the room, seeing how these amazing musicians were enjoying themselves. They became part of the music. You could see it in their bodies. When you're lucky enough to experience musicians of that caliber enjoying and playing so beautifully, it's, it's an amazing experience. I don't want anybody to think anything that I want them to think about Fella. The only thing I ask is that everyone actually listens to his music. I find a lot of people like Fella almost as a uh, celebrity, like a character to just admire. But have you listened to his music? Have you gone through an album and sat through it? You know, those long numbers, seeing the story that he's trying to tell. Have you listened to interviews? Have you watched documentaries? Fella was the first one who really came up and turned popular music into a form of protest, outspoken, explicit, confrontational protest. Well, Fela was a fighter. His music had a very strong uh, political uh, message. First, his level, his integrity, that he was so honest, no matter who or what he was dealing with, even when his views were so controversial. Even when sometimes I could argue I didn't entirely, 100% necessarily agree with them that he was brazen in the way that he said it. And he didn't feel the need to be shady. He was a man of integrity. He was very courageous. You know, he stood in front of death so many times. Courage, integrity, talent. Not necessarily just musical freedom he brought with music in the way that he expressed himself. On February the 18th, 1977, the Nigerian army, that thousand soldiers surrounded Kalakuta, broke into it, burnt it to the ground, raped some of the women, beat up some of the men. They threw a fella's mother out of the second floor window. It was an absolute outrage. They stopped the fire brigade getting there um, and it burnt to the ground. I was told about this the next day by my friends in London. I needed to go out to Nigeria and get the story. It was horrifying, the outrageous things that they did to try and shut him up, to stop him protesting about the corruption and incompetence of the Nigerian government. By the time I met Fela, this African man, I'm going to learn the truth now. I'll tell him my truth, and I'll tell him what's happening here in America. So how it all began was when Fela, after the clubs, we would always come, and then we sit down and we reason and we talk. I'd tell him about America, and he'd tell me about Africa. It was just the social level at first, what we thought we were going to do with the music is make the world a better place through music by teaching people, making them aware that we're all in this boat together. If we come together, build together, we can have a better world. We thought that the government would support us, especially Fella. Fella was so sure we had this beautiful idea but what we found out, <laughs> the government was against us because we were, through music, telling the stories that they did not want the masses to know. They have to bring them for prison, about 50, 60 of them will pack them for once. Fella had this club called The Shrine on Pepple Street in Ikeja. Once a week, he had something called Yabis Night. Yabis Night was open exchange of ideas with the public. The Shrine was paradise. It was a total cross-section of society. I'd get there around 2 a.m. with Fella. Egypt 80 would have already been playing for several hours. Fella would climb up on stage and the magic would begin. The atmosphere was electric. Growing up at the Shrine was my direct link to my passion for music. I used to see him rehearse with the band. I used to see them make mistakes. I used to see them do things very successfully. And the thing that moved me the most was seeing them perform everything that they had worked on. He was really talented. He was practicing 12 hours a day. He was so focused on everything that he was doing. At the Shrine, he would often talk to the audience a lot and explain what the songs were about. Quite a political event. 
Fela used to play a song live long time to the trial audience. Then he would tour with it, hopefully. Then he would record it and jump to the next song and would never play again the song of before because uh, every song was like a, a story and Fela would then jump to the next story. At the shrine, the audience, which is primarily Nigerian, they felt part of the music. They felt a sense of ownership for it. It was a very intense relationship between the band and the audience. What the music did for me, or what we thought we were going to do with the music, is make the world a better place through music by teaching people, making them aware that if we come together, build together, we can have a better world. Bass. Forget, man. When I used to choose his outfit theme, he had a tailor who would take the measurements of all the members of the performance. And there was a time where it would just be a color. It would be a color code, but then with an embroidery of Africa in the chest in the middle or on the left side. And then on the trousers, you'd have the Africa on the outer part of the trousers facing that way. Africa, Africa. We used to code the colors in such that the rhythm section, we would wear a certain color. Then the horns section, they would wear a separate color. But the theme would be the same. They'll have that Africa in the center or on the side pocket. And then the same thing with the dancers. They will have their outfit designed. They will look for a beautiful colored fabric, which they will design into what they could use to strap around the neck and then have a nice skirt with frills at the bottom. And then loads of beautiful beads adorning the necks sideways and on the waist. So that when they had to do dance solos, when the camera zooms in, when you see the beads are moving with the control of the waist and all of my Lord. Fella had very great fashion sense, I think. And he was, because of his attitude, he was classy like that. So his personality almost projected through what he wore as well. He had an urban style of dress, but his urban style of dress was still African, but it was urban style. He wore a shirt and pants. He didn't have all the adornment and things that he had on in his later years, and he always wore the loafer. So the style of dress never changed. The only thing that changed about it was the decorations or the ornament, the embroidery, and him bringing Africa forward is a fashion statement as well. He loved his clothes. He had just hundreds of outfits, and he would angst for ages over which shoes to wear with which trousers. One abiding image I have of Fala is combing his hair. He was really fastidious about his appearance. He was a fashionista, no question about that. From beginning to end, it was an amazing experience. It was all fun. We had no problems. On some sessions, you maybe get stuck with something that's not quite working well. Because they were so well rehearsed, they were playing in the studio what they had been playing for weeks on end in different clubs prior to coming to London. So they knew exactly what they wanted to do. It was just a matter of them coming in, feeling comfortable in this new environment, and playing what they loved playing. And so for myself, for the engineers, the studio staff that happened to be there, we had the time of our life. I mean, it was an experience that none of us had had before. I believe he would still be very happy that the Afro scenes is creating the world, because as well, that was one of his uh, fights, from my understanding, that the African culture uh, would be as present on the world than uh, anything else. Nothing quite like doing what you love to do, which happens to also be that which you are gifted with, and then doing it well and being able to trip on it. And I believe that was what Fela was. Fella was that type of prophet in his music, and he did his best to try and wake his people. And as a result, where's your legacy? What have they left for you? Or did they sell everything? That's how I, I see Nigeria today. And that's what Fella was doing in his music and raising the consciousness for everyone. 875,000 people are viewing Fella every month. That's 18,000 hours of viewing time. That's the equivalent of two years in man hours every month. It's a tremendous amount of 
continuing interest, despite you know, 24 years after Fellow's passing, in his music. I see his music as a chariot in which this message can ride. And the message is really saying, wake up, look at what's going on in the world. I miss Fela very much because he was very wise. I mean, he did crazy things. He puts himself in danger, blah, blah, but he would bring you so many cultural richness. Fela's legacy is that he has used music as the weapon. He planted that idea to use music and the weapon is to wake people up.